Uh, good morning. Delighted to be here. Before we talk about art artificial intelligence, uh, let's talk about intelligence. So there are lots and lots of definitions out there. And the one that I like to use the most is our ability to know what to do next. Or in other words, make decisions. At Prowler.io, that's what we focus on. We are a company based in Cambridge, 100 plus staff, less than three years old, and with our core passion uh, around making decisions for enterprise. Uh, before I go into the applications, I'd like to briefly touch upon the AI scene in Europe and how Europe could lead in the world of AI. If you look at the uh, popular press, it would seem that the big battle in AI and machine learning is really happening between two superpowers, which is China on one side and the United States on the other side. But there's obviously some good stuff happening out here, and we really need to start believing in ourselves. I was looking at uh, one of the data points the other day, which showed that 70% of the most uh, uh, popular papers in AI and machine learning were written by scientists who either studied in Europe or started their uh, careers in Europe. But it's easy to see uh, why we get a perception of this global struggle between two superpowers for their dominance in AI, and it's partly down to books like these. So one can't argue that great work does happen uh, uh, in China, in US, fantastic research going on, fantastic deployments, but together they account for 1.7 billion people, which is a lot of people, but Outside of these 1.7 billion people, there are 6 billion more people who aren't exactly hanging around uh, twiddling their thumbs. Especially in the uh, age that we live in today of MOOCs like Coursera, where technology, tools, and ambition has become democratic. So there's no reason for us not to be able to lead that race. So one good way to illustrate uh, what's happening in Europe and the power that we have here is this graphic that was posted uh, just before the New Rips conference uh, last December, uh, which some of you might know is the, one of the largest and the most prestigious AI and machine learning conferences in the world. And outside of the top five uh, big tech companies out there who obviously have a big budget and produce lots of good research, at number six is a tiny company in Cambridge uh, with, with a much smaller budget, which is at number six. So obviously we are doing something right here. But then if you look at this graph in a slightly different way, as mathematicians would normalize it uh, per dollar spent, the picture is slightly different. So per dollar spent, we are by far the most efficient AI and machine learning company in the world which is really the story of Europe. Europe does efficiency really well, and efficiency with high amount of quality. Because quality is important too. And that's uh, illustrated by uh, the results uh, of the papers that just came out uh, this week, actually, uh, of ICML, which is another very prestigious machine learning conference out there. So we can do efficiency, we can also do quality. And efficiency is key in the area of AI and machine learning, because that impacts how, um, um, how much amount of data do you need, what kind of compute power do you need, and with some of the latest research that we are doing, it shows up to three or four orders of magnitude more efficiency. So it's very clear that size does not guarantee success. And access to huge amount of data also does not guarantee success. One of the reasons why all of us here today are able to walk around with phones in our pockets and really go to any part of the world and make a phone call is because of the groundworking, groundbreaking work that was done in the 1980s where the European governments and European companies came together to build the global system of mobile communications 
GSN. And the AI industry, as we see it uh, today, reminds me of the mobile industry from the 1980s, where we have huge amount of fragmentation, both in terms of the technology stack and the interoperability. And there's huge amount of wastage going around there. So for AI to really meet its full potential, where we can have completely seamless systems going around the world, making our lives better and more efficient, we need to have some level of standardization. And that's where we could again lead the way, by building what I like to call the global system for artificial intelligence. We definitely have the skill, we have the history, and we most definitely have the culture to make this happen. And we should lead here. Switching gears, and let's come back to the nice world of AI, machine learning, and decision making. The popular press likes to talk about three waves of AI. The first wave was about numerical inputs, scientific calculators, Excel spreadsheets, and all sorts of um, fancy stuff going around there. I remember my days growing up in India and going to the university in 1991 and being handed my first scientific calculator. And before that, I had been using uh, log tables and, uh, you know, which are about kind of that thick to do any, any sort of calculations. I'm not sure anybody else in the audience is old enough to have used log tables. Uh, but uh, they were not fun. So I remember looking at it and saying, whoa, I mean, it was like pure magic. As far as I was concerned, it was the most intelligent thing I'd ever seen. Now, the second wave of AI or machine learning really started about five, six years ago uh, when there was a match between uh, some very good papers started to be productionized on deep learning, deep neural nets, uh, which, which have been good. So uh, they've had some remarkable breakthroughs uh, in terms of classification, that is uh, trying to recognize cats and dogs and trees inside pictures and actually telling you what they are, and also for playing uh, board games and video games. Right? But they have not really worked in the enterprise environments where real, meaningful, mission-critical decisions need to be made. And that's where the third wave of AI is starting to come, and we are at the very dawn of it. So the third wave of AI, it's all about making decisions. And that's where AI becomes meaningful, useful for corporations. And we at Prowler, are a company that focuses on making decisions. No matter what the doomongers say, there's going to be a job loss of uh, 40 million and so on and so forth. We don't believe in any of that. We are very clear in our mission. Our AI is there to continue to empower humans who will be further empowered by AI. And just to give you a feel of the nascent uh, situation with the science of decision making and AI, in the last three years, the fact that we have published 44 papers is not because we wake up every morning thinking, wait, we, 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 we're going to go and publish another paper. It's really we started off by solving, trying to solve real world problems, and because no prior art existed in solving those problems, we ended up writing papers as a byproduct, and the reason why we publish is to challenge ourselves as a team to see that if our mathematics stands up to the scrutiny of the best scientists in the world. Because if your maths is wrong, everything is wrong. If your maths is wrong about the space shuttle or the rocket, you aren't going to get to the moon or Mars or anywhere else. The maths has to be correct. So what sort of decisions do we enable? We work with some of the largest insurance companies and pension funds in the world for asset management. They're trusting us uh, to manage in massive portfolios. We work with some of the largest logistics companies in the world who manage up to hundreds of millions of assets every single day. And we're also working with some of the largest education companies in the world who I hope will make some good announcements about us in the next few months uh, or so. Uh, when we talk with companies, there's a very interesting um, feedback that we get, and that's really to do with explainability. There's been lots and lots of talks about explainability and why it's important in AI and machine learning. And there's no doubt it's important in AI and machine learning. But our customers keep telling us that explainability is not enough. 
it's not enough to explain what went wrong after it went wrong. We have to be able to trust our AI to not to go wrong in the first place. I was reading an excellent book by Rachel Boatsman on trust and technology. And uh, I'll just read through her quote so I don't uh, mess it up. So Rachel says that trust is not a nicety or a kind of an optional extra. Our very lives depend upon it. And similarly, when we work with our enterprise customers, <coughs> real jobs, real people, real families depend upon us ensuring that those AI-enabled systems can be trusted. So what is trust? So the Cambridge English Dictionary, uh, for obvious reasons, uh, being a Cambridge company, I can't use the other dictionary, uh, states that to believe someone is going to be good and honest and will not harm you, and that something is safe and reliable. And, and I'm sure most of you can relate to that definition. So how do we build trust in AI? So what we do is internally as a company and with our partners, we work on answering these four questions. How does the AI know that it is right? How does the AI know it is wrong? How does the AI know that it is going to go wrong? And most importantly, how does the AI know, or how do we make sure that even our AI is asking the right questions? So the reason why our customers uh, trust us and how we've been able to build trust uh, to deploy these systems is we always start with the problem at hand and agree on the KPIs. So that builds the trust. And the second element being is that we are able to work with very small amount of data. We don't need millions upon millions of data points. Hundreds or even tens of data points are enough for us to make very fundamental decisions. And I'll show you some of the results. And the third thing is we don't overpromise. We don't go around uh, telling the companies that, great, we have a massive AI brain. It's so good, it's going to replace your entire team. Because it's not going to happen. Right? So you have to be very careful with the, what you claim. And one of the most important things is we always go in and build trust and make it explainable through a network or a framework of human-machine teaming. Because it's equally important for our partners to understand the limitations of our AI so that at what point the AI reaches its limits where it needs to hand over control back to the human. Some of the results are up here on the screen, which you've achieved uh, in logistics. Uh, on one of the projects, we achieved about 75% reduction in failed pickups. We were able to reduce the operational efficiency of that organization for that particular section of the operations by 17%. And we were able to reduce the fleet size of another customer by 15%. Now, of course, these are great numbers for companies in terms of their bottom line and their shareholders and so on and so forth. But the biggest thing out here is the benefits to society this improvement brings. It has a massive impact on the reduction of CO2, the reduction of materials. And that's what we need to focus on as we deal with all the changes around the climate and other factors. In the area of finance, uh, this is a broad reflection of uh, the system that we've deployed with our uh, financial customer, uh, which is Mandatum Life, where we've created a fund which is jointly managed by human and, and the machine. The bits in green out there is what the humans do, and the bits in blue is, is, is what's done by Colorado. And it's a great example of how human-machine teaming can work really well together. The stuff that we are good at we execute, but with a good oversight from the humans who are essentially responsible uh, to their shareholders. And uh, here are some of the results. So uh, as you can see from some of the benchmark uh, indices that have been provided by our customers, the line in dark purple, sorry, I should have had more contrast with the colors. 
or the line in dark purple is what uh, Paul Rotaio is doing. And uh, given uh, the states of the market, uh, we are doing uh, quite well indeed. So I'd like to conclude my uh, presentation by really coming back to my core message uh, originally. That while there's lots of doom and gloom about AI and machine learning, it's not really that bad. Right? There's good stuff happening. There is positives. And while we need to be careful about the downsides, the upsides outweigh for them massively. And we at Europe need to continue to work together, come together to make sure that we lead in the field of AI and machine learning as we led in the field of telecommunications in the 80s and 90s. Thank you very much.